topic of this lecture is what wastewater and health related water microbiology. Our learning objectives for this lecture are to categorize microorganisms used in water and wastewater treatment based on their evolution, their sources of carbon and energy, their morphology, the way they grow, and their optimal oxygen and temperature requirements. Also to distinguish key features of the four major water pathogen groups, to distinguish the purpose, differences, and use of general fecal indicators, process indicators, and host-associated fecal indicators, and to describe the quantitative microbial risk assessment framework. So we can distinguish microorganisms that are used in water and wastewater treatment based on their evolution. And um, you've all probably seen or you're familiar with the tree of life, which you can see here. Uh, this tree, the branches in this tree are distinguished based on um, the genome of microorganisms or macroorganisms using for bacteria and archaea using the uh, ribosomal RNA gene. So you can see here that of the three major groups, we've got bacteria, which are one of the major groups of um, organisms used in water and wastewater treatment, but we also have many archaea that are used in water and wastewater treatment. Eukaryotes, uh, especially mi microscopic eukaryotes, are, are also very prominent in water and wastewater treatment systems. So we can distinguish these microorganisms based on their um, evolutionary characteristics. And you know, what are these microbes? Why do we care about them in water and wastewater treatment? Uh, they tend to be single celled, the ones that we utilize in, in design of wastewater and water systems. Uh, so bacteria, archaea, like I mentioned, some protozoa, which are eukaryotes. Uh, they tend to use food sources that are soluble and they produce, reproduce by binary fission. Some of them can metabolize contaminants in wastewater and others are pathogenic to humans. So these are some of the reasons why we care about microorganisms in water and wastewater. We can distinguish them based on their sources of carbon and energy. So this table shown in the slide here shows um, some of the nomenclature associated with microorganisms that use different types of carbon sources, like organic sources or inorganic sources. Um, so you can see that um, heterotrophs are those microorganisms that use organic carbon, whereas autotrophs are those that use inorganic carbon sources. We can also distinguish them based on their sources of energy. So we have here um, microorganisms that use sunlight, so, which are referred to as phototrophs. And we've got microorganisms that use chemicals. And the two different categories here are if they use inorganic chemicals for energy, we would refer to them as lithotrophs. And if they use organic chemicals for energy, we would call them organotrophs. So by combining these um, two dimensions together, we can come up with a naming system for microorganisms based on their sources of carbon and energy. The most common groups that you see in wastewater and water treatment systems are chemoheterotrophs, um, which are also technically chemoorganoheterotrophs, but they're mo most commonly referred to as chemoheterotrophs or just heterotrophs. And um, we also have chemolithotrophs. So these are also autotrophs. Uh, those microorganisms are the most common in wastewater, conventional biological wastewater treatment systems. In some natural wastewater treatment systems, we also take advantage of certain groups of microorganisms that would be categorized as phototrophs, including both photoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs. So just something to note that um, organotrophs are, also, are often also heterotrophic, and lithotrophs also tend to be autotrophic. So these other groups here, chemolithoheterotrophs and chemoorganoautotrophs, while there are some instances of their existence in uh, nature, they're not typically very prominent, in, especially in engineered systems. So we really deal with four major groups of microorganisms for engineering purposes.
We describe microorganisms in water and wastewater systems based on their morphology, and this in particular pertaining to bacteria. So bacteria can, can come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, including um, the coccus shape, which is like a circular spherical shape. We've got bacteria that are rod shaped. We've got bacteria that are spiral shaped. Um, and then some other shapes that you find also in water wastewater systems. One of the more interesting ones is the filamentous bacteria, which you tend to find in activated sludge systems. We just def describe these microorganisms as well uh, based on the way that they grow. So the two categories used when describing engineering systems are flock forming microbes and dispersed growth micro microbes. So flock forming microbes um, will form you know, these flocks or these groups of, of bacteria in systems and that makes it easier for the microorganisms to be removed from the water either by sedimentation flotation or filtration. Dispersed microorganisms would be um, more difficult to remove by, by sedimentation or filtration. We've also got biofilming microorganisms and these are used in a number of treatment technologies that utilize uh, surface area for growth of these microorganisms. So biofilm forming bacteria will, will form these biofilms kind of slimy surfaces on um, in wastewater treatment plants where uh, surfaces are in contact with the wastewater. Uh, the process for forming a biofilm involves three steps, which you can see here as attachment, growth, and dispersal. We can define and describe and categorize microorganisms also based on their oxygen requirements. And this, this feature of microorganisms is utilized quite a bit in the design of treatment systems. So we might design a reactor to be aerobic by pumping oxygen into the wastewater um, to take advantage of those microorganisms that are aerobic, they're obligate aerobes, they need to be in an environment with high oxygen levels or even microorganisms that are facultative which can survive in both oxygen rich environments and also anoxic environments. Um, but we might also de design some reactors to be anoxic or anaerobic where we would take advantage of different communities of microorganisms, particularly uh, for the treatment of high organic content wastes. And uh, using anaerobic technologies, we can produce some different byproducts from the waste treatment, such as methane, uh, which is a combustible gas that can be reused for an energy source. Uh, and we can also get the conversion of different forms of nitri nitrogen compounds to ultimately remove nitrogen from the wastewater. So we have a fourth category here called microaerophiles, which are microbes that need to be in an environment where there's oxygen, but not too much oxygen. So oxygen at a very low concentration. Microbes also tend to have optimal temperature ranges for their growth and survival. And we, bin these into categories that you can see here in this figure. The most relevant for environmental engineering, water and wastewater treatment systems include the mesophilic uh, bacteria and the thermophilic bacteria. So although you do find the other groups in different places in nature and, and in the environment. A microorganisms shape, morphology, and um, volume or size is very relevant in terms of how efficient it can be at digesting certain compounds or using certain foods, food sources. Um, so for example here, if we have a spherical bacteria, let's say that has a radius of one micron, we can calculate the surface area to volume ratio which would be equal to three in this case. If we took a larger bacteria, two micron radius, we can calculate the surface to volume ratio. And we would find in that case that it, was, it would be smaller. It would be less than, than the smaller bacteria, it'd be 1.5 in this case. Um, so this, this uh, ratio of surface area to volume has a lot to do with how, um, competitive, what competitive advantages 
one group of microbes would have over another one. So the ability for bacteria to take in and process chemical compounds where it needs to bring them in first through the membrane and then direct them towards the center or you know, other components within the cell. Um, if there's a larger bacteria cell, it will take longer to complete these processes, whereas a smaller bacterial cell might be able to complete some of those processes more quickly. However, at the same time, a larger bacteria will have a larger surface area and more potential for um, bringing in a larger number of chemical compounds. So there's some trade-offs there in terms of size, surface area, and surface area to volume ratio. So we can look at some different shaped microorganisms like filamentous bacteria, um, which have a string-like shape. And these bacteria tend to survive very well in environments where nutrients are scarce. So, you know, when, my, when a lot of other microbial groups are starved out of um, competitive advantage, these filamentous bacteria tend to take over and dominate. And so, you know, one of the reasons for that, you can imagine that this shape of bacteria is taking advantage of the two characteristics that I mentioned previously in this example. So they have a small volume, right? They're very long and skinny. Um, so they have that advantage of being able to bring in nutrients and um, compounds and uh, direct them to the center, towards the center of the cell. But they also have a very large surface area, kind of like the larger sphere. Um, so they're able to access a uh, larger amount of space in order to bring in those chemical compounds and nutrients. All right, and of course, we, we talk about microorganisms with respect to their human health characteristics. So are they pathogenic or are they the beneficial bacteria? And when we talk about pathogens, you know, a lot of times we think about, we might think about coliforms or E. coli, but in actuality, those are indicators that we use in water and wastewater treatment systems, and they're not necessarily pathogenic. Um, so the, for example, the coliform group includes some species that could be pathogenic, and E. coli, the same thing. Uh, some E. coli strains are pathogenic, but not all. And the group as a whole is not considered a human pathogen. However, we can describe human pathogens based on their shape, based on their evolution, and these following four groups, which are the most commonly uh, used way to group, the most common way to group water pathogens. So we've got viruses, the smallest of the pathogens. And some examples here are rotavirus, norovirus, poliovirus, and of course, uh, coronavirus. We've got bacteria. Some examples of bacteria that are pathogenic include Vibrio cholera, Salmonella, and E. coli. Like I said, some strains of E. coli. We've got protozoa group, which are actually eukaryotes. And some examples of pathogenic protozoa are Cryptosporidium, Giardia, and Entamoeba. And then we've got the Helminths group, which these are also known as intestinal worms, but their eggs are excreted in feces. So um, the eggs are microscopic and those would be what, what is found in wastewater. Uh, some examples of helminths include Ascaris, uh, Schistosoma, and Tania, which is tapeworm. So Ascaris being the roundworm, Tania is the tapeworm. Uh, so let's just get an idea of how big these pathogens are relative to each other. So I'm six foot four approximately. And if I were to, if we were to kind of blow up my size and the size of all the microorganisms around me so that I was as tall as um, being able to lie down in San Diego and stretch my feet in, from San Diego all the way up to my head in Los Angeles. So if I were that large and all the microbes were also increased by the same order magnitude, then a virus would be approximately the size of a grain of rice. All right, so relative to that, if a virus were as big as the size of a grain of rice, then a bacteria would be approximately about the size of a water bottle. If a bacteria were that size, then a protozoa would be approximately the size of one of these exercise, inflatable exercise balls. And a Helminth egg, would be approximately as big as a two or three story building. All right, so just to give you an idea of the relative size difference of the different pathogen groups.
uh, and there's the virus there, you can hardly even see it anymore. So let's go through some key definitions. Uh, pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms. There are also opportunistic infections, which are caused by organisms that um, are mostly only severe for people who might have weakened immune systems. Uh, but for other individuals, these organisms are not necessarily pathogenic. We've also got a variety of indicators and um, we can group these into the following categories described as fecal indicators, process indicators, transport indicators, or host associated fecal indicators. Um, and host associated fecal indicators are perhaps one of the newer groups. They're used in um, novel methods that are now making their way into practice such as microbial source tracking. Uh, process and transport indicators for microorganisms tend to be used for the most part in a research setting or a study setting. Uh, fecal indicators are widely used in practice and that's the group that includes E. coli, coliforms, and some of the microorganisms that you've um, probably heard of in terms of their application for uh, regulatory purposes. We've also got a category that we might describe as reference pathogens, and these are used for the method known as microbial risk assessment, which we'll talk about later on in this lecture. So what are some of the key environmental aspects that distinguish water pathogens and impact microbial risks? We've got their definitive hosts. So um, some pathogens are what we would call zoonotic. Their definitive host might not actually be a human. Uh, maybe it's uh, bovine, you know, cattle or cows, buffalo. Maybe it's a different animal species like pigs. Um, but they can also cross over and infect humans. So one example of uh, a pathogen that can infect cattle but can also cross over and infect humans is cryptosporidium. Uh, so we have to be, you know, equally aware when we talk about water and wastewater systems, we've got to be equally aware of potential contamination sources from animal manure. We can also distinguish water pathogens based on their prevalence. So some pathogen groups are just not found in all parts of the world. They're only prevalent in certain areas of the world based on climate, based on sanitation access, based on uh, a number of different factors. So here is a map showing um, countries that have reported cholera outbreaks in five years between 2010 and 2015. So you can see it's not, it's, it's absent from some parts of the world, but that hasn't always been the case. Of course, cholera was very common in the United States in, um, you know, a different time period. And there was a cholera outbreak in Latin America in, I believe, the 1990s. So these, these um, prevalence locations will change throughout time. Excretion rates are another way to distinguish water pathogens. Some pathogens are excreted in very high concentrations. Other pathogens are excreted in lower concentrations. Um, some pathogens that are excreted in, in human waste, like coronavirus, um, are not necessarily highly transmissible in, in human waste. So maybe their route of transmission is via another route like um, aerosols or uh, respiratory droplets in the case of coronavirus and with also some other water pathogens like adenovirus. Um, but they, you still might find them in human excreta and therefore they're present in wastewater. Survival by treatment. So some pathogens are, are more difficult to remove by treatment or they're more resistant to disinfection processes. And so that's another way we can distinguish different water pathogens. Um, and overall, their persistence in the environment may be different. So viruses tend to be more persistent in the environment than bacteria for the most part, uh, with some exceptions, of course. And um, protozoa and helminth eggs tend to be very resistant to certain treatment processes, uh, especially disinfection processes. Uh, while at the same time, since they're larger, they tend to be more easily removed from water using uh, treatment processes that, that involve size ex exclusion, like uh, membrane filtration or media filtration. The life cycle is another way that we can distinguish water pathogens. So different pathogens have different life cycles. Some of the more complex pathogens, like from the Helminths group, 
um, may have a pathogen or may have a life cycle that includes intermediate hosts. Like they have to pass first through a snail or they have to pass through uh, a fish or some other aquatic organism, or in some cases they have to first infect a cow or a pig before they can be transformed into a different life cycle stage where, which would make them uh, infectious to humans. So their life cycle and uh, their latency is another way to distinguish different pathogens and their potency. So some pathogens are more infectious than others. Some cause more severe diseases than others. And that's another way that we distinguish them. So what's the difference between pathogens, fecal indicators, and then all these other types of indicators like process, fate, and transport indicators? Well, fecal indicators, the ones that are most commonly used in a regulatory setting like coliforms, E. coli, and terococci, these indicators tell us if a water source is likely contaminated with feces. Not necessarily human feces because these bacteria reside in the GI system, not just of humans, but of pretty much most warm-blooded animals. And so you'll find, um, you'll find general fecal indicator at high concentration in water sources that are impacted by birds or by um, you know, cattle or other warm-blooded animal species. We also have host-associated fecal indicators. And this is the method that's uh, also referred to as microbial source tracking. So um, using a different approach, rather than cultivating microorganisms like is done for E. coli, or in Terracoccus, we use molecular techniques to target the genome of a specific strain of bacteria that we know is associated with uh, a particular host. Like we might use a strain that's associated with humans. One example is HF183, um, a target on a strain of bacteroides that is strongly associated with human waste. So we know that if we find HF183 in a water source, its indication is that the contamination comes from humans, not necessarily um, other animals. So uh, we, we can use these microbial source tracking methods to get a better idea of where fecal pollution is coming from. Because of course, fecal pollution that originates from humans is much more dangerous for other humans than fecal pollution that, in, that originates from animals, which can still, like I mentioned, there's still some zoonotic pathogens that can cause some diseases or that can cross over from, hum from animals to humans but human pathogens are much more likely to cause uh, a disease burden. We've got process indicators, and, and um, these tell us how well treatment or disinfection processes are reducing pathogen concentrations. And so some examples of process indicators that are used in research or practice include uh, clostridium spores, which are bacteria, but they're actually used as a surrogate for protozoa because they tend to be highly resistant to disinfection. Um, also colophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. So um, they infect E. coli specifically. So uh, we use them sometimes as process indicators to indicate general fecal pollution. However, colophages will survive in the environment longer than some bacteria like E. coli or in Terracoccus. So the colophages might be a better indicator um, for other human viruses, and therefore they're used in some cases as process indicators. We have fate and transport indicators. These help us assess how, how well pathogens might be able to move through the surface or the subsurface environment. Um, and these don't necessarily have to be microbial, so they could be chemical tracers or fluorescent dyes or synthetic surrogates of pathogens. And then we have host-associated fecal indicators, which we might also call microbial source tracking markers. These tell us, again, if the water is likely contaminated with feces that are originating from a particular host. And as I mentioned, HF183 is perhaps the most commonly used host-associated fecal indicator um, at this time. A little bit more about microbial source tracking and host-associated indicators. So, the, the reason why these work, like I mentioned, is that some fecal bacteria are associated with a particular species. Uh, and so we can tell if the, if the fecal contamination originates from humans or from some other warm-blooded animal. And again, we use genetic markers, DNA, 
the presence of a particular sequence of DNA. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the organism is viable or it doesn't necessarily tell us, tell us anything about infectivity, but it just tells us an indication of fecal contamination from a particular source. A little bit more detail into that. So Bacteroides marker, HF183, is the first of these types of markers that has been established in a standard protocol by the US EPA. And it's used quite frequently, in, especially in Southern California, by regulatory agencies such as the Water Board. Um, it's a member of the intestinal microflora that has co-evolved with humans, and that's why it's strongly associated with human waste. It's highly abundant, so there's up to 1 billion cells in each gram of human feces, and that makes it ubiquitous in wastewater, uh, not necessarily in the feces of all individuals, but when you take wastewater as a whole, it's uh, ubiquitously found. And like I mentioned, in 2019, there was a standard method published to detect HF183. Another example is crassphage. Crassphage is a bacteriophage. Uh, it's a virus that infects bacteria. That's not harm. It's not pathogenic for humans, um, but it was discovered in 2014 by SDSU researchers. Uh, it infects a strain of Bacteroides, which is a commensal bacteria of the gut that's also associated with human feces. And it's been proposed as a viral marker for human fecal contamination. So, you know, with different morphology, different things different characteristics than the HF183. Uh, pepper mild model virus is another example of a host associated fecal indicator. So pepper mild model virus is not, not pathogenic to humans, but it, it infects pepper plants. And um, we find it in hot sauce and in pepper um, products that are sold. And since humans consume these products almost exclusively, that it, this virus becomes one of the most abundant RNA viruses in human feces based on our diet, with up to 1 billion viruses per gram of human feces. And this is a marker that was also discovered by SDSU researchers. So to distinguish fecal indicators from pathogens, fecal indicators are mostly bacteria. They are present in larger quantities in feces and in the environment relative to pathogens. They are easier to detect and measure in the laboratory, less costly to detect, measure, and monitor, and they can indirectly suggest a health risk. Whereas water pathogens include, you know, pathogens from all four groups, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and helminths. They tend to be present in lower quantities, lower concentrations in the environment. They're more challenging to measure. The methods are um, more time consuming, more expensive, less standardized. And, um, but on the other hand, pathogens can be directly linked to a human health risk. All right, so related to water and wastewater treatment and disinfection, um, pathogens, of course, used to cause, in the US, used to cause quite a high disease burden before. Uh, water treatment and disinfection became widespread throughout uh, cities in the United States and uh, towns. So you can see here the graph on the right, which is showing on a log scale, it's showing the number of typhoid cases in the U.S. starting in the late 1800s. And you can see right around the early 1900s when filtration and chlorination became more widely used at water treatment plants throughout the country, you can see a very sharp decrease in the number of typhoid cases in the U.S., um, mostly because many of these cases were transmitted via water and um, filtration and chlorination are very effective at eliminating salmonella, which is the bacteria responsible for typhoid disease. So filtration re relies on size exclusion. It's very effective for larger pathogens, especially protozoan helminths. Um, it's not very effective against viruses because, again, viruses are so small, they can fit right through the pore sizes. Chlorination is capable of reducing viruses and um, definitely pretty efficient at reducing bacteria as well. However, it's ineffective against protozoa. It's almost completely ineffective against cryptosporidium, for example. And we'll talk a lot more later on in the semester when we get to the lectures on water treatment and disinfection. We'll talk a lot more about 
the fate of pathogens in water treatment systems and how well they're removed by different treatment processes, water and wastewater systems. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk about in this lecture is quantitative microbial risk assessment. So our goal is to understand this method and how it can be used to manage risks in particular. So there's four major steps in the QMRA process. The first is to identify a hazard. Um, the second is to evaluate the exposure route. The third is to model the dose response relationship. And the fourth is to characterize the risk. We also add two additional steps after the QMRA process, which include risk communication. So communicating this risk to the public and risk management. So coming up with strategies to effectively manage the risk to acceptable levels. So first step is to identify the hazard. And here's where we might use what we refer to as a, a reference pathogen. So this might be informed by you know, which pathogens present the greatest danger. Uh, we might include a reference pathogen from each of the four groups. Um, and I added uh, fungi to this list as well because there are some, some fungus species that can cause a uh, human health outcome that are associated with water. We typically choose these reference pathogens from some of the same groups like norovirus, rotavirus, uh, for the viruses. Uh, we tend to choose pathogens like Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella, and from the bacterial group, and then from the parasites, protozoan helminths, we might use Giardia, Cryptosporidium, etc. Second step is to evaluate the exposure. So the exposure route, by exposure route, I mean how is the infection, infection transmitted. So for most water pathogens, the infections are transmitted by accidental ingestion. Um, in some cases, inhalation could be a route for certain uh, microorganisms that are associated with water. There are a few parasites that are transmitted by contact with the skin as well. And, uh, but that's much, much less common for water, waterborne pathogens water pathogens. So ingestion being the primary route. So ingestion meaning, you know, the ingestion of contaminated water or if the water is used for irrigation, maybe it's contaminated food. Um, and we might have different parameters of that exposure. So who is being exposed? If it's food, you know, it's the people who are consuming that particular food item. If it's municipal water, then it would be people who use municipal water for drinking. If it's bottled water, then it would be people who use bottled water for drinking, right? So parameters of exposure being who is exposed, where are they exposed, when were they exposed, and for how long. Um, so for example, if, the, if we're talking about contaminated ocean water and we identify surfers as one group of individuals that has been exposed, we might want to know you know how long were they in the water, which could indicate their length of exposure. Um, and then what data are needed. So all of this would be components that, uh, pieces of information we would need to collect to perform a quantitative microbial risk assessment. Transmission routes include a variety of different activities, like the use of water for, let's say, some washing purposes. It can generate some aerosols that um, certain pathogens can be transmitted, like Legionella is one example. Um, so car washes, people who work in these facilities of course, if we're including you know, animal pathogens or foodborne pathogens, then people who work in the food industry could be exposed more than others. Um, sanitation workers, of course, are exposed to potentially contaminated materials. Um, and that would include in, in different contexts, you know, there, there might be uh, a large percentage of population that uses latrines or is not connected to a sewer. So in these settings, Frequently, there are small businesses that will remove fecal sludge from toilets, and you'll find this in many parts of the world. Um, again, farmers, people in contact with animal wastes that can contain zoonotic pathogens. Uh, food might be a source of pathogens transmitted through water. And then, um, you know, vectors like flies and other insects can can contribute to the transmission of pathogens. So an example of some different transmission routes for salmonella. Uh, salmonella is one of these pathogens that infects animals 
in addition to humans. So animal feeding operations, cattle, pests, chicken raising, um, these are all potential sources of salmonella, which can um, eventually contaminate and infect humans. Another example to illustrate the different infection routes, different exposure routes for pathogens is the Sustania solium. It's a species of helminth that causes a disease called tapeworm in humans. And um, however, the pathogen must be, uh, it's excreted in the human feces as an egg, and it must be ingested first by a pig where it develops into another life stage called um, an oncosphere. And then those develop in, as like cysts in the meat of the of pork, which if consumed raw or undercooked by humans could then result in the tapeworm infection. However, if the egg is consumed by humans directly, it will not cause tapeworm, but it will cause a different type of disease called cystocercosis. So here's an example of one single pathogen that can cause two different types of diseases based on the exposure route, two different exposure routes. So we're gonna do an activity in class um, kind of based on the game of categories. So I want you to think about how many different activities associated with water that might cause a unique route of exposure for microbial risk. So what's the transmission route and how would you think about quantifying a person's exposure via that route? The next step in QMRA is to model the dose response relationship. And this is done using data from a cohort study. So it could be um, where you have two different groups, and if one of those sources of water was contaminated, then you would study how many individuals became infected after consuming that contaminated water. Uh, a case control study is uh, where you look at, again, two different groups, but one group was exposed and the other was not. An experimental study is when you have human subjects, human volunteers, um, and maybe with one of the groups of human volunteers, you provide them with um, a, you have them ingest a certain number of pathogens. With the second group, you have them ingest a larger number of pathogens. Third group, you have them ingest even a larger number. Um, and then you see how many people in the group become infected and how many do not. So, of course, this type of study is the most difficult to perform because it requires extensive ethics review approval and, of course, can only be done with diseases that are not uh, dangerous for, for humans. But it also is performed with animals in some cases, and then those results are extrapolated to the human case. At the end of a dose response study, you come up with a relationship that relates how many pathogens ingested would result in a probability of infection. So, you know, if a certain dose is ingested accidentally, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a 100% chance of a person uh, to get infected. So it could mean that, um, you know, it corresponds with like a 50% chance and a person's immune system would have some defenses, which, which is the reason why a dose of just one or two or three pathogens doesn't necessarily mean that a person is gonna become infected. And this differs, this relationship and how steep the curve is and, and how far it is to the left or the right, this differs from pathogen to pathogen and from person to person. The fourth step of microbial risk assessment is to characterize the risk. So um, is it, does it result in just an infection, like an asymptomatic infection, or does it cause an illness? Um, is, that, is that risk daily or is it annual? And um, there's different unit, units that can be used to express the risk and to communicate it to stakeholders who might be involved in the management of microbial risks. So that's the next step is, is communicating and managing risks and uh, being able to, in particular, address um, things such as uncertainty and variability associated with, uh, with risk assessment. 